Okay, this video is how to live longer for beginners. And what happened was I was going to get interviewed. And I did get interviewed and I thought I was going to give this talk, but they just wanted to talk to me with no slides. So I got all these slides, so I'll just give a talk. Okay, so this is how to live longer part one and it's going to be for beginners. I'm going to talk about basic stuff, but I've also got some super cool, interesting stuff that I don't care who they are. They probably don't know it yet. It's really interesting stuff. Okay, so first of all, you know, why go low fat vegan? These little low fat vegans, they're still smart. Most Americans eating standard westernized diet, high fat, paleo, keto, all this nonsense. They're fat, sick, and stupid by the time they're 55, if not by 60, the vast majority of them. I got internal medicine friends in my own experience. The vast majority of people I talk to over 60 and older are real mentally slow. So anyways, look at these guys. Neil Bernheim, he's, what is he, about 68 years old? Something like that, I don't know. Um, T. Colin Campbell's in his late 80s. McDougal, he died at 77 by some unknown sudden onset thing. He was actually at his baseline a week before that. Um, Caldwell Esselstyn, he, uh, you know, is doing well, giving lectures at 90 years of age. So anyways, their brains age well. I'm interested in the brain. If you can get your brain to age well, usually everything else is pretty good. Um, okay, here's just a picture of the Fountain of Youth by Cronach, uh, the German guy around 15... 30 or something. Basically, the old people come in on one side, they come out on the other side, youthful and ready to, to go uh, for romance in the park. Okay, but anyways, but the point of the matter is we're never going to be 18 years old again, but you can at least slow down aging, and you can reverse it to some extent. You can reopen, and you can not completely take an occluded artery and reopen it, but if it's partially narrowed, stenosed, you can often improve it dramatically. You can make a lot of progress. Okay, here is the famous uh, photograph from The Night Playing Chess with Death, and this is the movie The Seven Seal by Ingmar Bergman. Okay, and we all do that. We're all playing chess with death, trying to stay alive and watch out for the problems in our environment. Here is you, you know, you're looking at the map when you go to a new tourist attraction museum or something, and basically here's your choices. If you're the typical chump, you eat the meat, oil, processed food like a dummy, you don't exercise much, you're stressed out, you're drinking caffeine, you don't get enough sleep, you go to the doctor, you're, you're a disaster, all your labs are bad, you're fat, sick, and stupid, they put you on a bunch of drugs, the drugs stop working, then you go for surgery, chop, 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 you're bankrupt, you die prematurely, the typical chump way to go. Okay, and here's what a smart person does. They say, gee, I've seen all my chumpy friends, fat, sick, and stupid, I don't want to end up like that, so... You start learning a little bit about nutrition, how to keep your arteries open, eating a low-fat vegan diet. You learn some of the social stuff, you know. Don't talk with your phone next to your head. Get your sunshine, exercise, sleep, have a purpose, religion, help other people, all this stuff. Johnson keeps working. You don't need to take any pills. You don't need any surgeries. This is sort of God's way to be healthy. It doesn't cost any money. Anybody could do it. And you'll probably die around 90, you know. Um, that's the smart way to go. Okay, here's some life curves. So basically, standard American diet, they're dead, you know, let's say by about 65 or so. But the, the other thing is this is called their lifespan. There's also something called their health span. They usually kind of, you know, got some major problems by the time they're in their late 40s, early 50s. And they're kind of a bunch of train wrecks, disasters. All right, Mediterranean diet, a lot of times this is what doctors do. So they're about 10 years better off, you know, maybe going to die. They're already having messed up health by the time they're in their late 50s, early 60s. But they die about 75, so they're 10 years better off than the average chump, but still not that what that well off. The low-fat vegans, like let's say the vegans of the Seven-Day Adventist study, and they're not even as healthy as a vegan could be because a lot of them ate more fat in their diets. But then you got a good chance to make it to 90, a little over 90. You know, it depends when you start it and all that. But in ballpark, on average, I show this. Uh, graph here of the Holy Grail of Health, meaning you know King Arthur's Round Table, and there's the Holy Grail, the vision of it in the center, and only Galahad was worthy to find the Holy Grail because he did what he was supposed to. You know, not like Lancelot, who was a great knight, but he's bonking Guinevere, and he wasn't supposed to be doing that. All right, so the point of it is that this isn't going to be handed you on a silver platter. You have to make a little bit of effort. Learn what's good for you, do those things, avoid what's bad for you, and don't do those things. Okay, it's not rocket science. You know the diet already. That's the most important thing. It's about 75% of health is low-fat, low-sodium, vegan with no oils, okay, whole foods, starch-based. Okay, then the other stuff, you know, we've talked about it before. Get your sunshine, manage your stress, get your exercise, get your sleep. And so the gist of it is if you do that, you end up like this. You know, basically, 
American diet, you're screwed. You plug up all your arteries, all the high fat. The Japanese, Asian, Korean diets, they do, they do better, but the problem they had is they tend to eat tons of sodium. That messes them up. The people from India and eat an Indian diet, what messes them up is they tend to eat a lot of oil, a lot of fried food. So all of them have a significant amount of disease. The, the, these East Asians were healthiest of them because even though they smoked a lot of cigarettes and ate a ton of sodium, they ate a lot of vegetables and a very low-fat diet. But the smart move is don't smoke cigarettes, okay? Eat the low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet, and you're better off in every category. What's not to like? What could you not like about that? It's all good. No side effects. It's free, and it keeps you healthy as possible. Like all this God's way of healing and health, you know? Be like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Eat plant foods, okay? It's not rocket science. Anybody could do it. And, you know, it's a little more complicated in the modern world that there's a lot of toxins in the food, the water and stuff, so you want to learn a little bit about that and avoid them, okay? And that's Galahad, you know, worthy to find the, the Holy Grail. And basically, we're like uh, Super Mario Brothers, a video game where the character, he goes through his obstacle course and he does the good things, he gets green energy points, avoid the bad things, which will decrease his energy. That's what we want to do. Here's just the same thing in a little more detail, uh, you know, when you get your sleep, you get your exercise, all these good things happen. Maintain your friendships, your relationships, you know, get your sunshine for vitamin D and vasodilators and other good things. Having a purpose in life makes you more resilient, all this basic stuff. Avoid all the bad stuff, all these toxins, all right. Uh, here's the concept of caloric density. You've heard talks about that. You know, oil's the worst thing. It's super caloric dense, you know, nine calories per gram. Meat and cheese are almost as bad, six calories per gram. These starches, look at these these low-fat starches. You're talking about in the ballpark of one calorie per gram. Okay, that's fantastic. That stretches your stomach early. Stre stretching the stomach causes early satisfaction and hunger. Vegetables are even lower caloric density. That's why vegetables help you to lose weight. But you can't only eat vegetables. There's not enough calories in there to satisfy your hunger. So the starch is a polymer of glucose, a bunch of glucose stuck together and surrounded in fiber. Once it goes in the intestinal tract, small intestine, the enzymes peel off the fiber, separated from the glucose. The glucose is gradually absorbed into the blood. You get this gradually increasing blood glucose curve that stays normal a prolonged amount of time. Because it stays longest or a very prolonged amount of time, you satisfy your hunger with the fewest number of calories when you eat starches. That's what you want to do. That makes you skinny. You don't want simple sugars because if you eat the simple sugars, you spike your blood glucose. And then your pancreas tends to overreact to that, expecting it to continue for a while. You drive your blood glucose down rapidly. It's called rebound hypoglycemia. And then you feel lousy, and you'll often, you know, eat a whole bunch of sweets real quick, and it'll spike back up. You end up with a roller coaster blood glucose curve, a recurring uh, hypoglycemia. You don't want that. That'll lead to overeating and obesity. Plus, you're not going to feel so good. All right, here is the curves for, you know, what's happening. Again, when you eat the starch, I call this the Goldilocks zone, the golden mean where you want to be. It's normal for blood glucose to come up a little bit after you eat. It's supposed to do that. But it'll stay relatively normal. It'll come back down pretty rapidly. And your hunger is satisfied the most prolonged amount of time relative to the number of calories you ate. We talked about rebound hypoglycemia with an overly sweet uh, beverage. Okay, but then here is what happens with the fat. When you eat the fat, it causes insulin resistance, something called overnutrition. It gets into the skeletal muscle cells, for example, faster than the glucose does, and it starts to overwhelm the inner mitochondrial membrane, and then the cell signals don't let any more nutrients come in. We can't handle them. So this is what's called a loss of glucose or loss of carbohydrate tolerance. So when you eat that combination of high fat and whatever the high glucose is, the glucose can't get into your cells postprandial after eating. So you end up with, after eating, postprandial hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. So it's the fat that causes diabetes. It's the fat that causes insulin resistance. That's important to know. And like Dr. Dr. McDougall says, how can you get better from diabetes if you don't know that? If you don't know that, you don't know what to do. What the diabetic, type 2 diabetic, should know is avoid fat. Then they'll have better insulin sensitivity. Then their sugars will improve. And then they can have a good chance to come off their medicines. Now I'm going to show you something really cool that hardly anybody knows. This is a guy named James Mitchell. He's a real smart PhD scientist at Harvard. And he's given a lecture here. You can go watch this lecture. I'll try to remember. I'll put the link in down below in the description. At the Bukinger, the Bukinger Wilhelmy Clinic. And he talks about protein restriction, how it improves glucose and lipid homeostasis, metabolism. Okay, so watch what this guy figured out. It's really cool. First of all, how much protein do people eat? 
Omnivores are typically eating 15 or more percent of calories from protein. Okay, I actually think it's higher than that, though they often describe it as 15%. Because these animal foods tend to be very high in protein. Look at salmon, the fish. It's like 50-50. 50% protein, 50% fat. There's no carbohydrate in animal foods except for milk. Okay, so that's a lot of protein. Lacto-oval vegans tend to eat somewhere in between, like let's say about 12%. All right, whereas vegans, they'll eat only about 10% or less of their calories from protein. Okay, a low-fat vegan is going to be eating pretty low percentage of calories from protein. This is going to be relevant because it actually ends up being a way to calorie restrict and increase longevity. We're just going to briefly show the structure of an amino acid. An amino acid has an alpha carbon in the center, and then it has a hydrogen on top like a head. It has a carboxylic acid on one side, and it has an amino group over here. That's why it's called amino because there's going to be an amino group and an acid because there's going to be an acid group, and then R is the variable. So here's a carboxylic acid, what it looks like. Here's an amino group, what it looks like. So this is why it's called amino acid. But again, the variable, the only variable is our group down below. And I'm going to show you, it kind of looks like uh, Jesu Christo on a cross. Let me explain. So the alpha carbon is like the heart. The H that's always present is like the head. The amino group is the one hand. The carboxylic acid is the other hand. And the variable is our group, how long the legs are. All right, so these are the amino acids. And there's 20 of them relevant to human metabolism. Okay, so that's going to end up being really important. There's about 20 different types of amino acids. The most important ones to know about for our purposes are methionine and leucine. And the relevance is that methionine and leucine are needed to activate mTOR. mTOR is like mammalian target of rapamycin, also called mechanistic target of rapamycin. And it is a, like a building contractor. I'll explain what that means in the next slide. So imagine you have a building contractor. The building contractors want to build a building, but they can't really start the building until they've got all their building materials available. And the amino acids are like the building blocks for building cells. We're talking about making cells replicate. And there's a couple of things they need. They need that methionine. They need that leucine. Animal protein's got a lot more methionine and leucine than does plant protein. So when you eat animal protein, cells can replicate faster. So that can be helpful if you want to build your muscles faster, but it's not good if you've got cancer because you want to slow down cell replication. Cancer replication of the cells is how the cancer grows. You want to slow that down. Also, you want to slow down mTOR because you want to slow down aging. You can calorie restrict an animal and give it less calories to eat, and you can slow down aging if you do that. However, that's not pleasant to starve. But if you simply protein restrict animal protein, you lower the amount of uh, available methionine and uh, leucine, and you can thus slow down mTOR in that way, which is what you want to do. Um, other things can elevate mTOR, ag activate mTOR as well. Excessive dietary fat causes insulin resistance, causes elevated insulin-like growth factor. That can also activate mTOR. Iron also helps activate mTOR. These tend to be rate-limiting steps. The leucine, the methionine, the insulin-like growth factor, and the iron. All of that's increased by eating high-fat foods and meat. Okay, here's just a diagram of, of mTOR. So mTOR is this nutrient-sensing pathway, like the building contractor. It needs insulin-like growth factor. It needs um, uh, insulin also activates it to some extent. You get higher insulin with a high-fat diet. And it also needs leucine and methionine and iron. Those are things that help activate mTOR. Okay. So by not eating those things, one slows down mTOR. And that's the point I wanted to make, that what you want to do is slow down mTOR, so you slow down the rate of cell replication, meaning you slow down the rate at which cells reach what is called the Hayflick limit. Hayflick, Leonard Hayflick, worked with human tissue cultures, and he found they only divide about 60 times. After the 60 cell divisions, the cell dies. All right, So your regular bodily cells, most of them only divide about 60 times, and then they die. You've got stem cells that keep dividing. They're special situations. But for your regular body cells, called you know somatic body cells, they only get about 60 divisions. So you don't want to accelerate that, otherwise you accelerate aging. So by not activating mTOR, you can slow that down. And so what do you want to do to slow down mTOR? Don't eat excessive amounts of fat, iron, or animal protein. Okay, That's what you do. Um, now did I show, I thought I had a slide where I show the mechanism of it. Let me see. Oh, the mechanism of uh, his work. Oh, I'm going to show it in the next talk. Okay, I'm going to show you in the next talk. It's one of the coolest things. You're going to want to see it. But this is the end for now of, of part one of how to live longer for beginners.